Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us online today. Welcome to the ninth ASEAN Connectivity Forum, streaming live from Seoul, Republic of Korea. My name is Hemi Kim, and it's indeed my great honor and pleasure to serve as your MC today for such a meaningful event as the ninth ASEAN Connectivity Forum, which is being held under the theme of working together for better connectivity in the next normal. As you all know, this forum is co-organized by the ASEAN Korea Center and the International Contractors Association of Korea in collaboration with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea and also the ASEAN Secretariat. And the ASEAN Korea Center has been organizing the ASEAN Connectivity Forum since 2013, which aims to support the ASEAN Connectivity Initiatives and the strategic areas of the Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity 2025. And unlike last year, this year's event will be held over two days. Well, first, on day one at the moment, we are conducting the opening ceremony, which will be followed by the keynote speeches and panel discussion later today, all of which will be and is being streamed live as we speak. And on day two, the ASEAN Korea Program Management Team will deliver a presentation on the ASEAN ROK Cooperation Fund, and connectivity-related government officials will deliver diverse project presentations on transport, energy, and smart cities, um, all of which, once again, will be streamed live online tomorrow. And at the moment, this forum is being broadcast live via the ASEAN Korea Center YouTube channel, and we are providing simultaneous interpretation service in Korean and in English for our multinational audience, so please keep this in mind. Well, once again, we would like to express our heartfelt appreciation to all of you, including our distinguished speakers and panelists, as well as our online and offline participants from ASEAN member states and also from the Republic of Korea who are joining us today. Well, thank you so much for coming once again, and we sincerely hope that we're going to have very constructive discussions today. So without further ado, let us begin the opening ceremony of the ninth ASEAN Connectivity Forum in earnest. Well, first of all, it is my great joy and privilege to introduce His Excellency, Mr. Kim Hae-yong, Secretary General of the ASEAN Korea Center, who will deliver his opening remarks. So now let me invite Mr. Secretary General up to the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him with a big round of applause. Good afternoon, His Excellency Lee Song Ho, Deputy Minister for Economic Affairs, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Korea, and His Excellency Ip Sang Nam, Chair of ASEAN Connectivity Coordinating Committee and Permanent Representative of Kingdom of Cambodia to ASEAN, and Mr. Park Sun Ho, Chairman of International Contractors Association of Korea, and Her Excellency, my friend, Nuria Yusuf, Ambassador of Brunei to Korea and Chair of ASEAN Committee in Seoul. His Excellency, Leng Tun Yutea, Secretary of State of Ministry of Public Works and Transport of Cambodia. And His Excellency, Timos John Batan, Under Secretary of Department of Transportation of Philippines. Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, and viewers, it is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you joining us both online and offline to the ninth ASEAN Connectivity Forum. First, I'd like to thank our co-organizer, the International Contractors Association of Korea, and our cooperating organizers, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of Korea and ASEAN Secretariat for making this forum possible. My special thanks go to our distinguished guest speakers and panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules. Over the past two years, the pandemic has shattered the global economies and transformed every aspect of our lives. However, ASEAN together took a bold step 
to address these challenges. With the adoption of ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework and its implementation plan, ASEAN has worked in solidarity to overcome the pandemic. The ASEAN member states have taken key initiatives such as COVID-19 ASEAN Response Fund, as well as the ASEAN Regional Reserve of Medical Supplies for Public Health Emergencies to combat COVID-19. Although we all have experienced restrictions on mobility under the pandemic, we, at the same time, realize the increasing relevance and vital role of connectivity, including digital connectivity. As supported by the Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity 2025, enhancing connectivity is one of the key strategies to deepen regional integration and contribute to more resilient and well-connected ASEAN. And this is why we gather together today at the 9th ASEAN Connectivity Forum. Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen, since 2013, the ASEAN Korea Center has organized annual ASEAN Connectivity Forum to bolster cooperation in promoting connectivity and its priority projects. This year, under the theme of working together for better connectivity, connectivity in next normal, our two-day forum will serve as important platform in expanding networks and seeking collaboration opportunities between ASEAN and Korea. Today, as our MC rightly put it, we have invited distinguished experts from ASEAN Secretariat, UNSCOP, and Multilateral Investment Guarantees Agency and Export Import Bank of Korea to discuss the ways to leverage ASEAN connectivity and build back better in the next normal. Tomorrow, pre-recorded uh, presentation videos will be released on the ASEAN Korea Center's YouTube channel. The first presentation will be made by the ASEAN Korea program management team to provide practical advice and guidelines for utilizing ASEAN Korea Cooperation Fund. Followed by the first presentation, ASEAN government officials will provide information on connectivity projects in transport, energy, and smart cities sectors to support strategic areas of MPEC 2025. Also, one-on-one -on -one business meetings will be held between ASEAN presenters and Korean businesses who have applied through the forum's website. In closing, I'd like to once again stress the importance of ASEAN-Korea partnership in revitalizing the region in post-pandemic era. I also hope that annual connectivity forum will play a vital role in enhancing ASEAN connectivity, as well as Korea's engagement in ASEAN connectivity priority projects. I wish every success in all the ongoing recovery efforts and good health to all our participants and viewers. I thank you very much. Kamsamida. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General, for your impressive speech. We really appreciate it. So, ladies and gentlemen, could you please give him another round of big applause? Thank you very much. <laughs> Next, please allow me to invite the Honorable Mr. Park Son Ho, Chairman of the International Contractors Association of Korea, up to the podium for his welcoming remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him with a warm round of applause. <laughs> Hello everyone, I am Chairman Park Son Ho of the International Contractors Association. I'm delighted to be co-hosting the 9th ASEAN Connectivity Forum together with the ASEAN Korea Center this year as we marked the 55th anniversary of the formation of ASEAN. Thank you very much, Secretary General Kim Hae-yong for his hard work in organizing the event. Also, Deputy Minister Lee Song ho of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, thank you so much for joining us despite your busy schedule. 
schedule. My special gratitude and welcome goes to Ambassador Pengeran Haja Nuria of Brunei to Korea, who is also chair of ASEAN Connectivity Coordinating Committee. Welcome to all business attending, especially my gratitude goes to chair of ASEAN Connectivity Coordinating Committee, Yep Sang Nam and all the businessmen attending with a great interest in advancing into ASEAN region, welcome. The ASEAN region, which is counted as one of the world's five largest market, is highly regarded for its potential. With its econ economy growing five-fold over the past 20 years, despite difficult conditions such as 2008 financial crisis. However, compared to the fast-growing economy, the improvement and expansions of poor infrastructure facilities are constantly being demanded. In 2016, the Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity, MPEC 2025, adopted and being promoted by reflecting this reality. I believe that the Korean government and overseas constructions company have a role to play in achieving this important goal. Our relationship with ASEAN is very special as our construction companies first started the construction work in Thailand in 1965. The ASEAN market accounts for about 60% of the accumulated amount of Korea's order from Asia, and this share has been steadily increasing since the establishment and announcement of the new sudden policy of the current government. In cooperation with the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport, our association also contributed to the expansions of the construction orders for Korean companies through construction diplomacy, such as support for the advancement through market development projects, support for land and transportation ODA project, dispatch of a public-private cooperation del delegation, and hosting the international events, all of which I take great pride in. Today's forum is a meaningful place to provide the latest information on transportation, energy, and smart city area promoted by ASEAN countries and to seek funding for projects despite the fact that coronavirus has not ended yet. I hope that this forum, which was prepared to explore the role of Korea in promoting ASEAN-Korea cooperation in the post-COVID era and enhancing the ASEAN connectivity, will serve as an opportunity to further expand and strengthen bilateral cooperation and the role of Korean overseas construction companies. Once again, I sincerely hope that our cooperation can be further upgraded and enhanced. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your outstanding speech. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please give him another round of big applause? Thank you very much for joining us today. Well, last but not least, we would like to introduce another very special guest. This time, our congratulatory message will be delivered by Her Excellency Pengeran Haja Nuria Pengeran Haja Yusuf, Ambassador of Brunei Jerusalem to the Republic of Korea, who is also serving as the chair of the ASEAN Committee in Seoul. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Her Excellency with a big round of applause. Good afternoon. Lee Song Ho, Deputy Minister of Economic Affairs, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Korea. Mr. Park Son Ho, Chairman of the International Contractors Association of Korea. His Excellency Yip Sun Nan Chair of the ASEAN. Connectivity Coordinating Committee and the permanent representative of the Kingdom of Cambodia to ASEAN. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Pengiran Haji Nora, Pengiran Haji Yusuf, Ambassador of Brunei Salam to the Republic of Korea. It is my pleasure to be here in my capacity as chair of the ASEAN Committee in, AS in Seoul to say a few words at this opening ceremony of the 9th ASEAN Connectivity Forum. Under the theme of working together for better connectivity in the next normal, 
this year connectivity forum is once again being held amidst uncertain times. Despite such uncertainties, ASEAN has continued to take collective efforts to support the region in rebuilding and recovery together. And although ASEAN connectivity has seen its challenges over the past two years due to COVID-19, connectivity has played a crucial role in the region recovery effort and in strengthening the resilience of ASEAN member states to deal with future pandemics. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, since the adoption of Master Plan of on ASEAN Connectivity 2025 in 2016, significant improvement has been made to connect and integrate the more than 620 million people of ASEAN through the five key focus areas. There are sustainable infrastructure, digital innovation, seamless logistic, regulatory excellence, and people mobility. In this regard, such areas of focus have been vital in the region's recovery efforts. Therefore, as ASEAN continues to strive towards recovery, it is important for us to continue to closely collaborate with our dialogue partners, including the Republic of Korea, towards nurturing a more cohesive and responsive region in facing present and emerging challenges. As ASEAN fourth largest trading partner, it is encouraging to note that the ROK continues to strengthen its cooperation in ASEAN connectivity efforts and in narrowing the development gap. With this, I'm encouraged to note that the last year ASEAN Connectivity Forum was able to successfully discuss how the ROK under the new Southern Policy Strategy can further support ASEAN Connectivity amidst the pandemic and in the new normal. It is also encouraging to see that ASEAN and the ROK have continued to work well on connectivity efforts in line with the upgraded New Southern Policy Plus, of which its seven fo key focus areas of cooperation with ASEAN have ideally adapted to meet the current needs of the region, especially as it addresses the pandemic. Under the NSP Plus, ASEAN look forward to further strengthen connectivity cooperation with the ROK in areas such as sustainable infrastructure, smart cities, digital innovation, and people mobility to enhance regional connectivity towards a more sustainable and resilient post-pandemic society. In this regard, projects supporting the implementation of the MPAC 2025, including the development of an ASEAN Open Data Dictionary and the Tibet Mobility Program are much more, are much appreciated and encouraging. Allow me to now to say a few words as Ambassador Brunei Darussalam to the ROK. For us in Brunei, I believe we can further work together with the ROK in pursuing connectivity efforts, such as through the development of smart cities and utilizing digital technology in infrastructure development to reduce development, developmental gaps. The pandemic has also shown us how important digital linkages are in staying connected. Thus, Brunei hopes to further collaborate with R the ROK in areas including digital innovation and in digital education 
especially how to integrate such advancement in our education practices towards uh, building a resilient and future-ready society. Lastly, I'm assured that this forum will have valuable and extensive discussion and on how ASEAN and the ROK can continue to work together towards enhancing ASEAN connectivity through the forum main focus areas of transport, energy, and smart cities, as we look towards learning to live in the next normal. Once again, I extend my utmost congratulations for the success of this ASEAN Connectivity Forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador, for your brilliant speech. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please give her another round of big applause? Thank you very much. <laughs> now it's time for our first keynote speech titled Korea's Role and Contribution to ASEAN Connectivity, which will be delivered by His Excellency, Mr. Lee Song-ho, Deputy Minister for Economic Affairs of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him with a big round of applause. Secretary General Kim Hae-yong of the ASEAN Korea Center, Chair of the ASEAN Committee in Seoul, Ambassador Peng Eran Haja Nuria, Chair of the ASEAN Connectivity Coordinating Committee, Ambassador Yeop Sam Nam, Chairman Park Son Ho of the International Contractors Association of Korea, Excellencies and distinguished guests. It is my honor to be here at the 9th ASEAN Connectivity Forum today. We are here at a time when international and regional cooperation remain a priority in the fight against COVID-19. The challenges are not limited to the public health front alone. We continue to witness its impact on the global supply chain and economic security as well, affecting our daily lives. Thus, ASEAN's slogan for this year, addressing challenges together, well reflects the reality that we are in. But at the same time, the slogan captures our determination to recover from the crisis. It points us to preparing for a more resilient and inclusive future. As we take steps towards that direction, enhanced regional connectivity will be a key factor in rebuilding our system. New roads and bridges will ensure smoother logistics and mobility, helping us restore the global supply chain. Expanding digital access will help more people take part in the fourth industrial revolution, equipping more people with tools to better prepare for the future, and resuming people-to-people -people connectivity in a safer environment will bring a deeper sense of community. ASEAN has been a front runner in recognizing the importance of connectivity. MPEC 2025, ASEAN's master plan for connectivity, clearly lays out priorities to connect the ASEAN region ever closer, fulfilling the vision of the ASEAN community. Connectivity is also one of the main pillars of ASEAN's outlook on the Indo-Pacific. AOIP states the goal of connecting the connectivities to help the ASEAN, Asia, Pacific, and Indian Ocean region become a closely integrated and interconnected region. Excellencies and distinguished guests, Korea too has been closely observing and participating in this process of advancing ASEAN's connectivity. Stronger partnership in connectivity is a part of the new Southern Policy and the new Southern Policy Plus. We are working to align NSP with ASEAN's roadmaps such as MPEC 2025. Among the five strategic areas of MPEC 2025, 
I would like to introduce the ROK's engagement in the following three areas. Sustainable infrastructure, digital innovation, and people mobility. First, regarding sustainable infra infrastructure, Korea is taking a comprehensive approach from planning to operation. Through the K-City Network Program, Korea helped design cities and communities. A partner in the ASEAN Smart City Network, Korea is building smart cities in many towns with the aim of enhancing the quality of lives of the ASEAN people. Transportation, too, is an important part of sustainable infrastructure. Sharing our know-how and experience, we are involved in the building of airports, roads, and subways to increase mobility within ASEAN. When implementing these projects, Korea consider the impact of climate change and our commitment to green recovery. This is why we seek green infrastructure and take an eco-friendly approach, aiming to utilize low emission technology. To better understand the unique demand of each country in Southeast Asia, Korean embassies have started hosting connectivity forums since last year. It is the venue to share information and benchmark best practice. Through this fora, we look, look forward to deepening our cooperation with ASEAN on connectivity. Second, Korea strongly supports ASEAN's efforts on digital transformation and innovation and believe capacity building in data management, which is the cornerstone of such adv advancement, is essential. Specifically, we are assisting the improvement of open data in ASEAN member states, a task stated in MPEG 2025. Utilizing the ASEAN Korea Cooperation Fund, a group of experts have initiated the ASEAN Public Data Development Project for Connectivity. The project aims to develop an open data dictionary and network and enhance the quality of public service in data management. Supporting the adoption of technology by MSMEs is also a key objective of MPEG 2025. Responding to this demand, another meaningful flagship project, namely the ASEAN Women's Economic Empowerment through Digital Literacy and E-Business Education has been launched. New opportunities from the fourth industrial revolution should be inclusive, and Korea will continue to help those most in need. Third, in the field of people mobility, Korea's flagship program is called TIM. Uh, TVET, uh, Technical Vocational Education Training for ASEAN Mobility. The new Southern policy puts people at the corner, and we believe that reducing the gap between vocational skill demand and supply across ASEAN can help maximize the capability of each individual. To narrow this gap, the team project aims to devise a common qualification assessment system within ASEAN, making it easier to match jobs and skills across ASEAN. Building on our past achievement, the Korean government will continue to do our utmost to advance our partnership with ASEAN. The new Southern policy is an action-oriented policy. Since 2017, we have more than doubled the size of ODA and ASEAN-specific funds, such as the ASEAN ROK Cooperation Fund. We are also institutionalizing our cooperation. The Finance Cooperation Center has been launched in Jakarta, which could help with infrastructure financing and fintech. Plans to launch an ASEAN Korea Industrial Innovation Center and ASEAN Korea uh, Standardization Research Center are also underway which will also contribute to harmonizing diverse regulation on connectivity. Along with government-led initiative, private sectors, entities, and individuals are constantly communicating with ASEAN counterparts, forging new friendship and exploring new potentials. Today's forum is also a part of these ongoing conversations. 
During the three-day program, I hope that participants have a chance to actively exchange views and deepen mutual understanding. By expanding our scope of cooperation on connectivity, we will have a better chance to recover smarter, safer, and stronger. Through joint efforts, we will be able to rise to the challenges with resilience. I look forward to ASEAN and Korea working together even more closely as we head toward building a future of enhanced regional connectivity. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Minister, for your eloquent and insightful speech. Ladies and gentlemen, please give him another round of big applause. Thank you so much for coming. Well, next, our second keynote speech titled Introduction and Progress on ASEAN Connectivity will be virtually delivered by, via video, His Excellency Mr. Ip Samnang, Chair of the ASEAN Connectivity Coordinating Committee, who is also serving as the permanent representative of the Kingdom of Cambodia to ASEAN. So without further ado, let's take a look. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome His Excellency Mr. Ip Samnang with a warm round of applause. Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I would like to express my deep thanks and high appreciation to the ASEAN Korea Center, especially to His Excellency Kim Hye Jung, Secretary General of the Center, for inviting me to be part in this auspicious occasion. It is my great honor to be here with you today to share some thoughts and update you on the development process of ASEAN Connectivity at this nine ASEAN Connectivity Forum with the team working together for better connectivity in the Dagnob Mall. The team is really on the right time and in line with the team of Cambodia's Championship of ASEAN 2022. It has reflected our collective response and reiterate commitment to implementing effective measures to overcome the pandemic, among others, the support for implementation of the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework and its implementation plan. Here, please allow me to share with you the main idea of the theme that Cambodia has chosen for ASEAN Championship this year. ASEAN ACT addressing challenges together. The theme underscores ASEAN spirit of togetherness as one community and the common will in our collective endeavor to address and overcome challenges facing our region. Togetherness emphasizes the action oriented approach of ASEAN that is based on openness good faith, solidarity, and harmony within the ASEAN family. Taking this opportunity on behalf of the Royal Government of Cambodia and ASEAN Connectivity Coordinating Committee, ACCC, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to co-organizers, the ASEAN Korea Center and International Contractors Association of Korea as well as the full support and cooperation of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea and the ASEAN Secretariat for jointly organizing this important forum. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, may I recall that the ASEAN leaders issued a statement on ASEAN activity on 24th October 2009 emphasizing the need to enhance intra-regional connectivity within ASEAN that would benefit all ASEAN member states through enhanced trade, connect, investment, tourism, people-to-people -people exchanges and development. The first master plan on ASEAN connectivity was adopted in 2010 to connect ASEAN through the three dimensions of physical connectivity Institutional connectivity and people to people connectivity. 
overall physical, institutional, and people-to-people -people activity has promoted economic growth, narrow the development gap, enhanced regional competitiveness, and promoted deeper ties among ASEAN peoples and between ASEAN and the rest of the world. Strong and vibrant connectivity is essential to ASEAN thrive towards becoming a more competitive and resilient region that is firmly integrated in the global economy. The Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity Impact 2025, which was adopted in September 2016, is more focused and more action-oriented. Through the Impact 2025, we aim to connect the 10 ASEAN member states with the five subject areas, namely sustainable infrastructure, digital innovation, seamless logistics, regulatory excellence, and people mobility. Since its adoption, the implementation of Impact 2025 has progressed as the AEEE's engagement and coordination has intensified with the lead implementing bodies, national coordinators, national focal points, and the relevant ASEAN central bodies. Also, engagement with external impact 2025 key stakeholders, ASEAN dialogue partners, and other external partners, multilateral organizations, development banks, sub regional organizations, and private sector has expanded and strengthened. To date, 14 out of 15 initiatives under the Impact 2025 are in implementation phase with encouraging progress. At the same time, we also noted the challenges of some projects, such as long internal process of supporting dialogue partners, considerable time required for stakeholder consultations, and capacity of implementing agencies or consultancy firm. Scope of some projects has been adjusted to ensure they remain relevant to address emerging issues which have affected the timelines of these projects. Despite challenges posed by the evolving COVID-19 situation, the ADCC, in close coordination with the key stakeholders, has continued to exert effort in ensuring steady progress in the implementation of Impact 2025. The ADCC has also engaged with ASEAN partners to deliver existing cooperation projects and explore potential follow-up projects to advance the implementation of IMPACT 2025. In this connection, I would like to convey our high appreciation to the Republic of Korea for its active contribution to the implementation of IMPACT 2025, and I look forward to its continued support in this regard. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me highlight some of the notable progress and possible adequacy deliverables for 2022 under the five strategic areas of impact 2025, among others. On strategic area of sustainable infrastructure, namely, first commencement of rolling in and out of projects from the initial rolling priority pipeline of ASEAN infrastructure projects. And second, loans of report on the state of urbanization in ASEAN. Our strategic area of digital innovation, there was development of an assessment report to develop a diagnostic tool to assess micro, small, and medium enterprises um, as um, is digital readiness and second, loans of ASEAN Open Data Dictionary. Our strategic area of similar logistics includes first 
completion of the framework on ASEAN supply chain efficiency and resilience and the supply chain analysis of 10 specific product groups. And second, socialization of the framework and the database. Our strategic area of regulatory excellence is to complete a handbook as a guideline to use the methodologies in conducting and regulatory review on drug and TMs. And for strategic area of people mobility, of people mobility such as completion of mobility tool one, qualification and standards, and tool two, internship and faculty exchange guidelines, and the loans of student internship and faculty exchange, and the last study on graduate employability on ASEAN, the contribution of student mobility. As one of Cambodia's deliverable for 2022, we will also propose an ASEAN leader statement on ASEAN activity post-2025 vision. This statement aims to chart out the reason to enhance ASEAN activity beyond the impact 2025 encompassing synergies between up-to-date developments and past lessons and experiences. In spite of many good achievements have been made, there are also more works remain to be done and improved, such as mobilization of the potential resources to finance the priority projects and programs the urgent need to find out good way and mean to disseminate the projects and programs to all relevant stakeholders and donors for their support. The conversation from key actors under the Impact 2025 into the projects is a very important step forward and more ambitious in realizing the ASEAN community. Therefore, I strongly encourage all relevant stakeholders with the support of the ASEAN Secretariat to continue upholding such vital works in order that all the strategic areas and initiatives under the Impact 2025 would be smoothly converted into the doable and implementable projects. As we all are aware, the needs for infrastructure investment in our ASEAN region are more than 100 billion US dollars per year. This is one of examples. If such amounts of money are to be raised, policymakers need to mobilize all the potential sources of capital and consider innovative schemes for infrastructure financing, particularly those involving the private sector. As clearly identified in the Impact 2025, a public-private sector partnership, PPP, is a significant approach. Effective PPP development requires effective regulatory and strategic structure to be in place. Therefore, the existing legal frameworks which may have an impact or effect on the PPP projects should be adjusted and reinforced. We agree with the recommendation as contained in the final report of the midterm review of Impact 2025 that the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated the ability of Impact 2025 in adapting to the changing circumstances. Current and new projects are adjusted and designed to make into account the impacts of COVID-19 and the changing trends to support recovery 
from the pandemic and build resilient against future pandemics. However, each initiative requires development of different specific approaches and implementation. Cross-learning from implementation of initiatives and projects as well as establish linkages between the initiative can create synergies and optimize resources for better outcomes. The need for sustained cross-sectoral and cross pillar engagement and coordination with key impact 2025 stakeholders is clear. To achieve better outcome, we agree that such efforts need to be translated into greater ownership, better alignment with the work and priority of the relevant ASEAN central bodies, as well as stronger in-country coordination to ensure sustainability of, dealer, of deliverables in, of impact 2025, setting the ASEAN connectivity agenda beyond 2025. In order to address these challenges, the ACCC is considering the score framework presented by the ASEAN Secretariat, which serves as a guide in implementing Impact 2025 initiatives through ensuring the, sustain, the sustainability of initiatives, enhancing coordination, strengthening ownership, mobilizing internal and external resources and deepening engagement with stakeholders and partners. Following the endorsement of the midterm review of Impact 2025, the ACCC has developed a work plan to implement the recommendation of the midterm review 2021-2025. The ACCC agreed to develop a concept note on a workshop to brainstorm and share best practices among league implementing bodies, the relevant ASEAN central bodies, national coordinators, and national focal points to strengthen coordination and national implementation of Impact 2025, as well as to discuss the connectivity projects ideas with relevant ASEAN central bodies. ACCC also discussed ways to establish the ASEAN connectivity with dialogue partners and other external partners working group. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, finally, may I wish you success in deliberation and a chain of views for the six of finding the way on the six of finding the way out as the key recommendation on how a single activity can contribute and play an important role in supporting the region rebuilding and recovery efforts as well as on how to enhance a single activity towards an inclusive, sustainable and resilient ASEAN community. With my strong anticipation, the forum will be surely, gratefully, and successfully conducted to meet its objectives and to realize our utmost goal in order to enhance better connectivity and more consolidated the strategic partnership between ASEAN and the Republic of Korea. I thank you for your kind attention. Yes, do please give him a big round of applause. I'm sure he's joining us online and listening to you. So thank you so much once again. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for your exceptional keynote speech. We really enjoyed it.
So that concludes our keynote speech session. And now before moving on to the panel discussion, we are going to take a 10 minute break. And during the break, we are going to play some short video clips uh, prepared by the ASEAN Secretariat, which are designed to introduce the master plan on ASEAN Connectivity 2025. So please enjoy your break and also please enjoy our videos as well. So without further ado, let's take a look. ASEAN, a region of opportunities with a young and growing population of more than 620 million people. By connecting ASEAN, we connect these opportunities. Over the past 50 years, ASEAN has shown significant progress and benefits from its regional integration efforts. Its GDP nearly doubled to reach US $2.6 trillion between 2007 and 2016. We can deliver more. The Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity 2025 aims to achieve a seamless, integrated and comprehensively connected ASEAN. This will promote competitiveness, inclusiveness and a greater sense of community. What does that mean for you? The Master Plan will improve the way you live, work and travel. It will enhance the physical infrastructure that brings us together. It will link our institutions to support our cooperation across borders. Through all this, it connects everyone in this region as one community. ASEAN is a vibrant, growing, multicultural region. Our diversity is our strength. To better harness this potential, ASEAN connectivity will bridge the country's individual strengths to make us collectively stronger. ASEAN connectivity will help us better work together on our common challenges. Our region needs a significant increase in infrastructure investments to meet our growing needs. 90 million more people will call our cities home by 2030. Productivity will also need to grow. We also need to cooperate to reach our full potential. Together, we form the third biggest workforce in the world and one of the world's biggest consumer markets. There is huge potential in our digital economy. Our economies are uniquely positioned to benefit further from global trade and investment. ASEAN connectivity will be enhanced through five strategic areas. Sustainable infrastructure, increasing investment, improving infrastructure productivity and building better cities. Digital innovation, supporting adoption of technology, using digital innovations to improve financial access and enhance data sharing and management. Seamless logistics, lowering costs and improving supply chains. Regulatory excellence, providing common frameworks and removing trade barriers. People mobility, enhancing skills and enabling the movement of our most vital resource, the peoples of ASEAN. Through these areas, the Master Plan provides a framework for everyone to benefit and come closer together. The Master Plan for ASEAN Connectivity 2025, reaching for a better tomorrow by connecting ASEAN today. When we talk about connectivity, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Is it about digitalization, smart cities, free flow of goods and services, or is it the ease of travel in the region? It goes beyond that. In 2016, ASEAN leaders adopted the Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity or MPEG 2025 that aims to create a stronger network of infrastructure, governments, businesses, and peoples that will improve the way we live, work, and travel across the region. And by 2025 has benefited the peoples of ASEAN for improvement of physical, institutional, and people-to-people -people linkages. Now, Let's take a look at how ASEAN helps the progress of ASEAN Connectivity. Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity 2025 focuses on five 
strategic areas through 15 initiatives, in which significant progress has been made. In 2018, in 2019, in 2020, and many more in 2021. While the COVID-19 pandemic brought significant challenges to the regional connectivity, MPEG 2025 highlights increasing relevance of connectivity due to the pandemic. MPEG 2025 supports post-pandemic recovery, creating benefits for the region, just like how it could promote sustainable infrastructure investment that can generate economic growth and create jobs, as well as strengthen supply chains to facilitate seamless flow of goods and services. MPEG 2025 promotes resilience in the region through actions under sustainable urbanization, digital connectivity, and human capital development to better manage future crises. For example, investing in digitalization will build more resilient and inclusive businesses in the post-pandemic region and share our future digital economy. MPEG 2025 holds significant potential for socio-economic impact in ASEAN. For example, up to 35.9 billion US dollar investment from ASEAN infrastructure pipeline. Digital trade to create over 100 billion US dollar of exports. And an additional 15.5 million annual visitor arrivals. ASEAN continues to implement and deliver MPEG 2025 and together we can seize the connectivity opportunities. For more information about the roles of MPEG 2025, go to connectivity.asean.org.
Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? The ninth ASEAN Connectivity Forum will resume in a few minutes. So please come into the hall and please take your seats. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We sincerely hope that all of you enjoyed our video clips, which gave us a succinct introduction of the master plan on ASEAN Connectivity 2025. Now, without further ado, let us begin the panel discussion session, which will be held under the theme of leveraging ASEAN Connectivity in the post-pandemic world. Well, in this session, we will discuss how and what uh, various stakeholders have done to support the ASEAN connectivity amid the pandemic. And we will also share their views on various ways to build back better by enhancing connectivity. And for your information, two of our distinguished panelists are joining us online today via Zoom for today's panel discussion, which will be moderated by Professor Lee chung Yeol from Korea University. And prior to the commencement of this panel discussion, I would like to kindly inform our online viewers that you may raise questions using the YouTube live chat function, and there will be a separate Q&A session at the end of the panel discussion. And finally, we would like to ask for your active participation in this panel discussion so that we can generate fruitful results together. So ladies and gentlemen, please do participate in our panel discussion proactively today. So now let me hand over the microphone to our distinguished moderator and our discussants. Professor Lee, the floor is all yours. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome them with a big round of applause. Uh, thank you for the MC for the introduction of this program. Uh, good afternoon, everyone in this room and the one who watched this program uh, through the online. It is time to have a panel discussion in the ninth ASEAN Connectivity Forum. I'm a professor Chung Yeol Lee in Korean University at Sejong in Korea. I'm very honored to be a moderator of this important forum. As we all know, the connectivity in ASEAN is one of the most important subjects for ASEAN to build the ASEAN economic community and other ASEAN community. Without close connectivity among ASEAN member states, uh, it cannot be established the community. Uh, ASEAN Korean Center has managed this ASEAN Connectivity Forum for the past nine years. It has contributed to the improvement of the connectivity of these ASEAN regions, uh, particularly the role of Korea, or role of some institution in Korea has been discussed here. Several times this, I have made a presentation in this forum uh, today. I became a moderator. I will take uh, about 16 minutes 
for this panel discussion. Uh, there are four panelists here. Uh, they are waiting for their presentation here. Each presenter will make uh, take about four, five to seven minutes, and it will take about 20, 30 minutes. Then we may have another 30 minutes. It will be a Q&A session and a free discussion. If you have any questions on the topics which presented by the speakers, is, then we may give questions on the online or, or the offline too. Then panelists will give us some answers to his opinion when, when they have here. Or I may give a question if I have extra time this. Now, let me introduce the first speaker. His maker is Lim Chechen. He's a, a director and head of the ASEAN Connectivity Divisions in ASEAN Secretariat. Actually, he was uh, one of the members is, who made this ASEAN um, uh, Connectivity Master Plan 2025. He's in charge of coordinating all these ASEAN uh, Connectivity project here. Le Please welcome Mr. Lim Chan Chen. He's going to speak about five to seven minutes on this, how the ASEAN has been proceeded for past years is one, what is a challenge for in the future. Okay, it's your turn, Mr. Lim. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Lee, for the kind introduction. Um, excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you. I would like to thank the ASEAN Korea Center, especially Secretary General Kim Hae Yong, for holding the ninth ASEAN Connectivity Forum and for inviting me to discuss connectivity with all of you. In my presentation this afternoon, uh, I will share some thoughts on the Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity 2025 and the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic I will talk a little bit about the partnership during the Q&A session. Um, next slide, please. We have seen an overall good progress of MPAC 2025 initiatives, as you can see in this chart and the next one. Uh, Ambassador Samnang and earlier speakers have provided detailed and excellent progress updates, so I will not go into the details here. Uh, as you have heard, 14 out of 15 MPEG 2025 initiatives are in the implementation stage. One initiative remains in the planning stage. Uh, within the 14 initiatives that you can see on the screen, um, progress varies in terms of the breadth and depth of the initiatives. So some are moving faster than others. Uh, some uh, require more time uh, in, in coordinating uh, outputs. So you can see that the diagrams here shows the number of key implementing measures and the output metrics that have been completed. Uh, next slide, please. So what I will do now is to share with you some five points on how COVID pandemic has affected ASEAN connectivity and what we are going to do about it. Uh, first, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted ASEAN economies and the progress of enhancing connectivity. The ASEAN region is projected to recover in 2022 with an average growth rate of 5%. The pandemic has both revealed and accelerated a number of trends that will play a substantial role in the shape and path of the future global and also ASEAN economy. This will require us not just to adapt to new ways of doing things, but also to rethink how we have been doing things and how we can do things better. Next slide, please. The second part is we have seen digital transformation across the public and the private sectors being accelerated. And this will continue after the pandemic. ASEAN's digital economy is expected to grow at a five-year compounded annual growth rate of 24%, reaching about US dollar 309 billion by 2025. Growth will be supported by positive demographics, rising affluence, and technology adoption in the region. As policymakers continue to encourage digital adoption, um, the access, quality, and affordability of connectivity will command the associated infrastructure that is needed to provide a faster 
and more reliable internet for the region. Next slide, please. The third part remains relates to logistics and supply chain. With shocks growing more frequent and more severe, it is recognized that the region needs to expand and improve logistics and supply chain networks for the post-pandemic recovery. So in ASEAN, we are working on a framework to enhance supply chain connectivity. The ability for us to reroute components to main, manage agile production across sites can keep production going in the wake of a shock. And this will require us to invest in robust digital systems as well as analytics. And one of the things that we have seen is cold chain is also an increasingly important area of focus for ASEAN Member six. Next slide, please. The fourth area regards sustainability and resilience. Um, the focus on sustainability has gained significant ground in ASEAN and with the increasing role of cities in advancing sustainable development, embedding resilience in urban systems and infrastructure will be particularly important. Renewable energy and electrification are primary path to low carbon economy. It was also found that both private and public sectors across ASEAN member states have been increasingly more active in mobilizing green, sustainable, and sustainability link bonds in the past few years. And the main proceeds have been going to the energy and building category. Next slide, please. The, the, the last part that I'd like to talk, the fifth part is, it was found that some ASEAN member states have limited capacity to tap on international infrastructure finance effectively. In addition, there are also immense need for technical assistance, capacity building, knowledge sharing opportunities, particularly to support project preparation and implementation. And this will actually help to attract project financing. ASEAN deal volume in 2020 exceed those of 2019. This was largely due to an uptick in renewable energy deals in the region. There are vast opportunities for ASEAN to engage our partners, particularly Korea and the private sector, to forge more partnerships and work together to find and develop solutions to realize these opportunities in infrastructure in the post-pandemic ASEAN. Let me briefly touch on the midterm review that we have undertaken uh, back in 2020. Um, the midterm review of the MPAC has shown that ASEAN connectivity is crucial for us to support recovery through infrastructure investment and supply chain efficiency. And it is also important to build resilience through sustainable urbanization, digital innovation, and human capital development. So the elements of both recovery and resilience are particularly key for us uh, to advance the connectivity agenda post-pandemic. The midterm review has identified about 17 recommendations to address six key challenges. Uh, some of the key challenges that they've identified are national level implementation, sectoral alignment, as well as how we can engage our partners more effectively to mobilize resources to implement the MPAC 2025. So the writing is on the wall. We know that there are all these different things that are being changed, these things that, are, that require our intervention. So the question is, what do we do about it? What efforts can we take together with our partners? And how are we going to go about cleaning this wall? So it is time for us to think differently, innovatively, about alternative approaches in delivering connectivity. So I'll pause my presentation here. I will go into more on partnership later in the Q&A sessions. Thank you very much, moderator. Uh, thank you very much for your good presentation. We are appreciate of your, your review and also the challenges for the ASEAN uh, connectivity here. The second uh, speaker is the Mr. Ruhimat uh, Soe Kanesopa. 
He's from UN SCAP in Bangkok. He's a head of the sub-regional office of the Southeast Asia in uh, UN SCAP. And also he is working on the, the uh, MDG, Millennium Developed Goal in, in UN for these things. And also he's going to explain on the, what's the challenge for the ASEAN connectivity from the viewpoint of the uh, UN. And thank you very much. Please, it's your turn. Uh, thank you, Professor Lee. And again, uh, thank you to the ASEAN Korea Center for inviting ESCAP. We are, all, we are always pleased uh, to participate in events organized uh, by Korea, particularly in this topic of, of connectivity. So uh, we have been tasked, uh, at least from uh, the organizers, to talk about uh, how ASEAN connectivity could achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, as well as address the issues of the post-pandemic uh, recovery efforts, particularly with a focus on ASEAN's regional economic cooperation in enhancing uh, uh, connectivity. Uh, so as we are going through the second uh, phase of the COVID-19, and obviously uh, the pandemic has had a profound repercussions on development gains, undermining progress in the achievement of the 2030 development agenda. Uh, the fact that COVID-19 crisis could potentially throw back the achievements of decades-long efforts resonates particularly strongly uh, with Asia and the Pacific, uh, including ASEAN, where uh, pre-COVID-19 uh, assessments were already highlighting insufficient progress on most of the SDGs. If we look at uh, the figure, uh, connectivity, there is some progress uh, with respect to SDG uh, goal number seven, nine, and 11. But we should also be mindful that there are also consequences with respect to how connectivity is being uh, developed. Uh, we can see that uh, it has affected greatly SDG 13 and 14, climate action and a life uh, below water. So as we look to achieving uh, the 2030 agenda, we should also look at those SDGs where have shown some regression or lack of progress, such as uh, in climate action and life uh, below water. Today's topic on regional connectivity uh, is uh, directly linked with the implementation of SDGs. So today's topic uh, on regional infrastructure network of, for energy, transport and ICT form the vital underlying structure which enables and shapes the material and information flows supporting overall socioeconomic development. Obviously, connectivity is one of the priority areas for regional cooperation in the regional roadmap for implementing the 2030 uh, agenda. Uh, permit me to highlight some of the work of ESCAP on connectivity as it relates to the connectivity uh, in ASEAN. So the Asia Pacific Information Superhighway, uh, the network of Asian highways, trans-Asian railway and dry ports, and the regional efforts to integrate power grids across borders are the major vectors of regional connectivity and an engine of the region's sustainable development. As it is in the area of regional connectivity, the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us that some important lessons on the key forward in shaping the future of Asia and the Pacific. Let me give you some, uh, one example uh, relevant to, uh, to this session's focus on cross-border uh, infrastructure. Amidst great disruptions of human mobility, trade services, and much more, uh, there were also cases where a crisis was met with a swift and pra pragma pragmatic action along the main regional trade and transport corridors, crystallized in the regional network of the Asian highways, trans-Asian railways, and maritime ports, tremendous efforts were made by the governments to preserve cross-border trade and transport connectivity uh, during the pandemic. Most of the country's members of the ASEAN Highway Network maintained all or a significant part of their land borders open for freight. Two thirds have implemented special trade and transport facilitation measures, helping a smoother movement of essential goods and in many cases of general freight. Freight transports also proceeded with very limited interruptions along with the Trans-Asian Railway Network and rail has become an even more vital link 
in international trade, especially for movement of essential goods and medical supplies. Ports remained operational for freight, supporting the bulk of the global trade and preventing full dismantling of the global supply chains. One of the most striking part of these policy responses is the remarkable leap in digitalization as more and more countries in Asia and especially in Southeast Asia have piloted uh, contactless solutions and electronic platforms for the interactions along the global and regional uh, supply chains. Despite these efforts made by countries, regional connectivity did not come out of unaffected from the pandemic. We all, we all know that even prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, challenges in regional connectivity has been hampering our progress towards sustainable development. These challenges are even greater now. Trade and transport connectivity, the great divides in digital and paperless trade across the region are likely to be exasperated by the pandemic. Entire groups of countries continues to suffer from low levels of land and maritime support connectivity. This is most often the case for the least developed countries, landlocked develop, developing countries and small island developing states. Moreover, the way our economies and societies are connected is inefficient and unsustainable, causing increasing environmental and social externalities as we fail to explore full advantages of rail and waterborne transport in the region which is naturally and historically endowed uh, in these areas. So the pandemic has impacted the costs and delays of cross-border operations and caused tremendous economic losses for trade and transport sector. Uh, in the energy sector, the COVID-19 crisis demonstrated the importance of access to electricity as a critical enabler for both remote work and distance learning the impact of COVID-19 on power consumption has also revealed the value of renewable energy sources, which because of its low operating cost, has provided an increasing share of power generation in recent weeks. Recovery plans can and should accelerate progress on SDG 7 by increasing investments in accessing and renewable generation. To this end, SCAP has developed a, the electricity connectivity roadmap for Asia and the Pacific among other things. In the IT sector with COVID-19, digital connectivity has taken on a compelling new meaning for regional connectivity. For one, countries such as uh, the Republic of Korea has managed to put together digital technologies to, to effective use, having shown signs of better combating cluster outbreaks and gaining the public's trust by sharing credible information in a timely manner. We can see this awareness of the potential for building back better in terms of regional connectivity, clearly in the current preoccupations of the countries. For example, in trade and transport connectivity, the immediate response to COVID-19 disruptions was driven by pragmatic and immediate concerns related to managing cross-border freight operations in the light of new health and illness uh, constraints. However, as countries start contemplating recovery, other considerations surface. They focus on greater and better connectivity, built on increased transport worker safety, digitalization, resilience, and overall greater sustainability. There is an appetite in our governments to use the crisis to build back better, and also the fundamental question is whether these are enough capacity resources to follow up uh, with solutions. Uh, as I conclude, uh, let me emphasize that our future connectivity, we need to take a qualitative leap. It should prime, uh, it should prime full digitalization using smart infrastructure, paperless trade and intelligent transport and logistics. It should seek greater resilience through multi-modality uh, and greater operational connectivity, which would enable all places of global transport and logistics chains function in a smooth and flexible manner. Decarbonization uh, 
a must uh, must decouple the intensity of our freight operations from the CO2 emissions through greater use of rail, waterborne transport through promoting higher energy efficiency, as well as all modes of transport and through increased trade of decarbonized electricity across uh, borders. The implementation of the master plan on ASEAN connectivity is part and parcel of the ongoing work and partnerships we have created within the complementarity initiative and the ASEAN UN plan of action. Uh, we look forward to much more uh, as SCAP celebrates its anniversary of 75 years of promoting connectivity in Asia Pacific as well as uh, with ASEAN. So with that concludes my uh, presentation, uh, uh, Mr. Moderator, and thank you for your kind attention. Well, thank you for your excellent presentation. And he's uh, talking to the how the, the COVID-19 has impacted on the ASEAN and also the connectivity. Particularly, he said the cross-bordering trade and digitalization and railroad connection and port importation. And he said a lot of things on the how the COVID-19 has made an impact on the connectivity of the ASEAN. At the same time, how the uh, market also the system has been revolved here. Now we, we are going to move to the two presenters uh, who is, who is uh, right next to me here. Uh, Mr. Jin Jae-young, he is a multilateral investment guaranteed agency. He's, we call it MIGA, and he's a, div it's a division of World Bank. He's a Korean head. He's going to say about how the MIGA will enhance the connectivity of the ASEAN. Actually, the title of this, this forum is Leveraging ASEAN Connectivity in the post-pandemic world, therefore the, we have to focus on this, this the finance sector is on this ASEAN forum. Okay, Mr. Jin, it's your turn. Um, thanks for the kind introduction, uh, Professor Lee. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor to speak at this event. Um, yeah, um, according to the, uh, the recent uh, published uh, World Bank's uh, global economic prospect. Uh, growth in the ASEAN country, uh, excluding Brunei and Singapore, rebounded to 0.3% uh, in 2021. Uh, but, the spread, but the speed of recovery uh, deepened uh, among, among countries. Uh, growth in the region uh, is expected to recover uh, gradually uh, over the next two years. Uh, as a domestic uh, demand and uh, uh, vaccination rates uh, increase. However, uh, spread of uh, COVID-19 uh, variants alongside uh, high inflation, uh, debt, and uh, uh, inequality intensifies on uncertainty in the region. Under the this situation, um, the, let me explain how uh, MIGA can help uh, the country and the uh, uh, investor uh, in the ASEAN region. Uh, MIGA is a member of a uh, World Bank group uh, to achieve a World Bank's groups, uh, the two uh, twins goal, uh, eliminating the extreme poverty and the boosting uh, shared prosperity the MIGA promotes uh, cross-border investment in developing country uh, by providing the guarantee to investors uh, and the lenders. MIGA provides two types of uh, guarantee to investors and the lenders, uh, political risk insurance and uh, credit guarantees. The MIGA's guarantee protects uh, investment against uh, non-commercial risk and uh, uh, can help investors to obtain uh, access to financing on improved uh, financing uh, terms and conditions. MIGA has a um, unique uh, business model. The first is uh, private sector uh, mobilization. The MIGA guarantee helps uh, mobilize uh, private capital uh, into the uh, developing countries.
Secondly, uh, the key benefit uh, of mega coverage is the ability to resolve a conflict before they become a, a claim over the event. So when a project uh, faces a challenge, uh, MIGA can leverage its World Bank Group's network, which include uh, in-country presence and a strong relationship with a host, host uh, country government. Third is uh, supporting the ESG investment. The even before uh, the ESG become a trend, the World Bank Group was the uh, front runner for ESG investment and uh, setting the global uh, standard. Lastly, um, MIGA has a global reach. Uh, as an institution uh, with the World Bank Group, uh, MIGA aims to uh, bring in uh, development impact uh, to developing countries. MIGA has uh, supported uh, more than 900 projects in more than uh, 100 countries. The, let me uh, briefly uh, introduce uh, uh, the recent uh, some mega supported uh, project in ASEAN countries. Uh, in response to uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the mega launched a uh, $6.5 billion uh, fast track facility to help investors and the lenders to tackle the, the crisis. As a part of the, this effort, the MIGA supported the uh, um, Indonesian power utility company, the PLN. Uh, PLN is uh, the working capital uh, facility by covering eight commercial banks. It enabled uh, PLN to pay to uh, seven the renewable IPP company project during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. The other project is uh, um, Korea Land and uh, Housing Corporation, LH, LH is an uh, industrial complex project in Myanmar. The MIGA provided uh, uh, political risk insurance coverage to LH's equity investment uh, before the, the political event took place. Uh, while this project is on hold uh, at the moment, uh, MIGA is currently uh, working with uh, the Korean client to put their uh, project uh, back on the track. The in the face of uh, uh, post-pandemic era, uh, the World Bank Group uh, intend to uh, maintain an exceptional level of support uh, in this fiscal year. Uh, while there are major risk and uncertainty, the stakes uh, could not be uh, higher and the risk can become opportunity for the countries. Strong and uh, sustained commitment by the international com community uh, will be the most critical uh, determining factors uh, in the years to come. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jin. <laughs> He's explained the role and the function of MIGA at the same time, how the Korean investors and businessmen and product manager can utilize this MIGA program to, to reach the program, uh, the project in the ASEAN regions, is, and particularly in the uh, connectivity ways. Is. Okay, last one was the, he's from the, I think, sorry. His name is Mr. Om Sang Young, he's from Exim Bank. He's export and import uh, bank of Korea. He's a director general of the EDCF Fund. EDCF Fund means Economic Development Cooperation Fund, which is organized by Korean government to uh, give an ODA on these developing countries. And also it has a, a lot of experiences. He has a lot of experiences to maintain this uh, EDCF Fund to enhance the uh, connectivity of the ASEAN. Okay, Mr. Om, it's your turn, thank you. Uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, thank you for kind uh, uh, introduction. Uh, uh, very af good afternoon, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Om. Uh, today, uh, I'm 
discuss about uh, uh, how to finance the real project in uh, Asian region for enhancing the connectivity of the Asian region. Basically, we are talking about the importance of the connectivity. Uh, the keynote speaker and also some uh, panelists have uh, uh, presented the importance and uh, the midterm uh, uh, impact of uh, Asian connectivity so far. But now I'm going to discuss uh, how we support this project. Uh, basically, those connectivity-related projects need a lot of huge amount of uh, fund uh, money to actually implement those uh, projects. Uh, but uh, uh, in reality, uh, in many cases, uh, the investors, not only from only government side, but also from the public, uh, private sector side, they need some fund investment and also some debt service to actually implement those those projects. So as a, a financial institution uh, uh, people, I'm going to discuss about uh, how we, the EDCF, can uh, support those projects in financial terms. Uh, yeah, as uh, moderator uh, introduced, uh, EDCF is an economic development cooperation fund, which is the government, uh, Korean government ODA loan project. So we provide basically the loan for the uh, for the uh, uh, the developing partner countries in uh, in over, all over the world, and uh, this fund was established in 1987, and since then Korea Exim Bank uh, was entrusted by the government for executing uh, this fund. And this is very uh, brief organizational chart. Uh, uh, for the EDCF. Basically, the owner of the fund is uh, the Ministry of uh, Economy and Finance of Korea. And under uh, owner ministry, Korea Exim Bank uh, has played as an executing agency for the fund. And I'm the Director General of the Planning and Coordination Department. And uh, under, e uh, under EDCF, there are seven uh, department and half of the department uh, uh, is doing for the operation, and the other half of the uh, department uh, covers the, some policy issues and also the MDB operation and cooperation issues. And these are uh, some numbers, uh, the financial performance of EDCF. Uh, since the establishment, uh, we have committed uh, more than 20 billion U.S. dollars for uh, 57 countries, and total project total project number is 485. So uh, 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 we have uh, supported a lot of project, but uh, I will discuss um, in later. But now we are going to focus on the uh, post-pandemic uh, era and also how we mobilize and uh, uh, attract more uh, investment from uh, private sector. And this is brief uh, introduction about the allocation of EDCF. So far, by reason, uh, of course, the uh, Asia is the most uh, priority sec uh, reason so far. Uh, uh, consider more than 60% and followed by Africa and also by the sector allocation. Uh, of course, the transportation is the most priority and followed by health and then water and uh, sanitation and energy, etc. And also those are the uh, some priority sectors uh, and areas uh, from now on for the EDCF. As I mentioned, the transportation is most important sector for us. And also I believe transportation is very uh, related to the connectivity issue. And also uh, for the uh, energy sector, uh, 
Uh, it also uh, very important for us because nowadays the climate change issue is one of the most important uh, uh, agenda all over the world. And energy sector is very uh, uh, related to this uh, climate change uh, uh, issues. And this is uh, a brief uh, explanation uh, how EDCF uh, uh, working for the uh, post-pandemic uh, uh, era. Basically, this is, these are the numbers that uh, the extreme poverty uh, population all over the world. In 2015, <clears throat> it's about uh, 740 uh, million people are under the extreme poverty line, and it is declining uh, steadily. But in 2019, after 2019, which when the uh, COVID-19 ha uh, pandemic happened, the number increased sharply, and it reached more than also five, uh, seven million, uh, 700 million people. So what we are going to do, uh, what uh, EDCF wants to do is to decline this, uh, uh, this trend uh, to uh, the era before uh, the pandemic. And those are the, uh, the priority sectors that EDCF also focus on. First, uh, green, green sector, second, uh, digital, third, and health. And the last, uh, it is not the sector, but as I mentioned, we want to uh, invite more private sector investment for the uh, for the project, so we would like to diversify our modality, not only for the public sector, but also for the private sector. So for the green, green sector, <coughs> sorry, the number uh, in 2020, we reached 200 million, but we target uh, more than 600 million by 2025. And also for the digital sector, from 300 million to 800 million by 2025. And also for the uh, health sector, after pandemic happened, uh, health sector is a uh, very crucial uh, sector for uh, our partner countries, uh, especially uh, where uh, not appropriate uh, health service is uh, in, in the in, uh, country. So we, incre we would like to increase the uh, volume for health sector from 400 million to 1 billion by 2025. And uh, from, time, uh, from this time, I would like to uh, discuss about uh, some modalities of uh, EDCF. Basically, uh, these are uh, some our uh, financial uh, uh, product. First, uh, development loan and equipment loan and program loan and public-private sector loan, something like that. And those are all the related to the uh, loan, but also uh, we would like to uh, uh, increase our modality to the investment and also guarantee. And I will skip this uh, page since it is very same uh, with the previous page. And this is a, a brief uh, modality for the PPP uh, project. Actually, the concessional loan, like EDCF, can play very basic uh, catalytic role for entire project. We can support uh, the ODA loan to cover uh, kind of a very uh, uh, basic uh, uh, risk, uh, risk and then uh, based, based on the ODA loan as a subordinated loan for the project, export credit and also private uh, finance can be uh, added for this project. Uh, yes, and I will skip this, uh, this page and I will briefly explain this page because uh, uh, some infrastructure uh, project, not only the loan and investment, but also it, we need some preparation. And for the preparation uh, period, not only the loan, but also the grant had to be added. 
So we have some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, fund for the grant support. And through the grant, we can uh, analyze and we can do some uh, delivery, uh, deliver some uh, uh, feasibility study, whether it is feasible or not. And based on the uh, feasibility study, EDCF can provide a loan for the, uh, for the government and also sometimes for the PPP uh, SPV. And then the SPV can uh, uh, attract more uh, fund from uh, private sector. And these are the countries that we uh, uh, so far uh, supported. Uh, in Asian region, the Vietnam is the, uh, the, the largest recipient, and Bangladesh, Philippines, and also uh, for the Africa, uh, first uh, top uh, recipient country, Ethiopia, followed by Tanzania and Ghana. And in Latin America region, Nicaragua was the first, uh, uh, the largest recipient, followed by Bolivia, Bolivia and Guatemala. And uh, from now on, as a last part, uh, I will uh, introduce some uh, example project. First, in Vietnam, uh, for the uh, transportation uh, sector, as I mentioned, it, uh, this sector uh, contribute uh, more than 34%. In Vietnam, Bam Kong Bridge, uh, which connect uh, the, the Mekong region uh, across the river, and then the Philippines, uh, we support uh, the EDCF fund for uh, the development of airport, and also for the water and sanitation. Uh, it uh, consists more than uh, 13 points, uh, out of total uh, allocation. Nicaragua, uh, the uh, water, tre uh, water treatment project, and also in Laos, Mekong River Integrated Management Project. And also uh, for the health and education, uh, this project, Tanzania project, uh, we uh, support the fund to uh, uh, set up, uh, to construct the uh, the uh, medical center, which is the largest uh, medical uh, hospital in Tanzania so far. And also for the Cambodia, we support uh, the Korean, uh, National Cambodia Korean Vocational Training School. And through this school, uh, um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, students uh, can learn uh, the vocational uh, training. And then uh, the energy sector uh, for Mozambique, uh, we support the construction of uh, portable tannic power plant project and also in Ethiopia, uh, the power transmission project uh, has been happened. Yeah, and uh, another uh, project is ITC we uh, don't have project time, in please. Shulong. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I will skip all of this uh, project. And uh, I, I, I would like to uh, uh, emphasize that uh, through EDCF fund, uh, we can help our partner countries to make it happen for the connectivity of uh, ASEAN region. And uh, uh, again, the most important thing is we need some uh, uh, fund to implement uh, actual project. And there are uh, the representative offices in all over the, uh, the ASEAN region. So whenever you need, you can uh, contact us and then I can uh, introduce our representative in your country to discuss how we can uh, uh, help your uh, project and also uh, we can introduce another uh, partners uh, so far. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the presentation and also I think that Mr. Om like to say a lot of things on what his uh, institution was doing, but unfortunately we don't have enough time. Okay, we may have some questions from the floor or the papers or we made questions on these things. And one thing I like to ask is to Mr. Lim here, is he here? Okay, he says a lot of things on the 
on the ASEAN connectivity and progress and other things. But the question is, how was the pandemic make these things? Change it? Do you, do you have make a, a kind of arrangement on your program or make a changes on the program or progress or something like that? How the pandemic has made on in your program or progresses? Please explain. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee. Um, when it comes to the pandemic, I think we have undertaken a, a midterm review uh, for the entire master plan of ASEAN Connectivity 2025. Uh, we also look at um, pandemic impact on different initiatives under the master plan as well. So what we do is we, we try to embed some of these developments uh, into the implementation of uh, our initiatives and projects. So let me give an example. For example, we have uh, the initial pipeline of ASEAN infrastructure projects. So before the pandemic, what we have done is uh, that pipeline consists of transport, energy, and in some cases, ICT related projects. So because of the pandemic, now we have done another assessment to look at what are the new infrastructure areas or what are the infrastructure priorities that we should be focusing on. So, so in, in that assessment, what we have done is we, we have included other infrastructure projects like digital infrastructure, supply chain infrastructure, and also to look at other aspects as in social infrastructure. So some of these will eventually emerge when, when we uh, look at uh, prioritizing infrastructure projects and updating the initial pipeline, which we, add, we aim to do in the next uh, one to two years. Okay, thank you. And one of the thing I may ask us is that we have so far two years of pandemic crisis, but we don't know what's going on in the future, so that we cannot say right now. But so far, based on these two years of experiences, there was something to be changed. And also, do you have anything to say on the World Bank front, front side or the EDCF front side, please? I think. Pandemic has changed many things. And also uh, the developing countries are facing a number of challenges. The, I think including um, the declining the FDI and uh, increased uh, macroeconomic uh, volatility and uh, subdued uh, growth and uh, uh, volatile uh, commodity price. Uh, under the this situation in response to a uh, post-pandemic era, actually the, the World Bank Group uh, the launched what we call the greed approach. Um, greed means uh, green, uh, resilient, and uh, inclusive uh, development. The green uh, demands the focus on the uh, sustainable, sustainability uh, solutions and uh, uh, resilient dimension uh, emphasizes the price uh, preparedness, preparedness uh, to minimize uh, damage uh, from the sudden the disruption. And the inclusive uh, dimension uh, promote more the inclusive uh, culture with a uh, greater the investment in, in human capital. I think uh, uh, we, we the, based on the lessons that we learned uh, during the uh, pandemic, I think uh, uh, we need a more uh, the integrated and uh, uh, integrated approach uh, to address uh, those, those issues. Thank you. Yes, uh, basically uh, for EDCF, also a uh, two-year pandemic has been impacted a lot. Uh, basically, because of the uh, most countries uh, have some their own uh, quarantine policies, uh, we cannot send uh, some technical uh, uh, ex experts to our partner countries. So most of the uh, project was just uh, suspended for uh, during last two years. So uh, after pandemic, we increased the volume, uh, not for the individual project, but also for some kind of uh, uh, budget support project uh, program, which means uh, we call it uh, program loan. So we uh, approve 
some amount of money for certain uh, specific uh, our developing countries, and we just uh, transfer that money to their uh, uh, account so that they can utilize those money for purchasing vaccine and uh, uh, set up their own uh, quarantine policy, something like that. And those uh, uh, some uh, changes in modality of our uh, program is most important change yeah, during the pandemic era. Thank you. Uh, one of the uh, panelists who is in Zoom is Mr. Ruby Matt, or Miss, or Mr. I don't know, but he's going to have a question. Uh, is that? Oh, yes, uh, thank you, Professor Lee. I just have a question to, to the uh, to, Mr., uh, to Mr. Jin Jae Jung and Mr. Um. Uh, you talk about uh, you know investment opportunities in uh, in Southeast Asia, and I think you mentioned that uh, there have been a number of projects uh, you know in the in in the Mekong, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam. I would just like to ask if you, uh, in addition to uh, you know government uh, funding, do you also provide some sort of uh, private sector or corporate bonds, specifically green bonds? Because when we talk about uh, you know, financing, especially within the context of uh, the pandemic recovery and also achieving the SDGs, it is important that the investments are also uh, sustainably financed. And that I mean uh, looking at uh, you know, indicators that promote uh, inclusive uh, uh, you know, recovery, digital resilience. So does uh, Korea also promote, and especially uh, do your institutions promote uh, instruments such as green bonds? And in, in some ways, how can you help develop developing countries in Southeast Asia promote such investments, particularly uh, to connectivity? Uh, thank you, Professor Lee. Thank you for your answer. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 actually, I'm uh, I'm from the EDCF group, but also uh, as a name of uh, Korea Exim Bank, uh, there are another uh, groups in our uh, institution. Not only the ODA loan program, but also we have some ECA function, and also EDPF EDPF function. EDPF means in between uh, terms and condition. Uh, between the uh, ex, uh, ECA, fung, ECA uh, program and ODA program. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, 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 entire Korea Action Bank wants to support the connectivity of Asian region. And also, as you mentioned, we also focus on kind of uh, ESG activities. So nowadays we increase the, the issuance of our green bond and through that money, we uh, focus on to uh, support the green project in uh, our partner countries, especially in Mekong region. Uh, so uh, uh, I think if the project is uh, project has the sufficient uh, 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 commercial uh, uh, aspect, then we support ECA uh, investment for those commercial projects. But if there is commercial, commercial level is not enough to, in, to attract uh, uh, private investment, we support ODA loan to increase the, uh, the commercial uh, level for the project. So those kind of uh, some uh, uh, activity, uh, uh, diversify uh, activities uh, under Korea Action Bank, we can support yeah, those kind of green project. Okay, thank you for the uh, good and excellent answers and reply. Okay, the one last one is that it's from the private sectors. Uh, what could the private company, I mean the Korea and other uh, the maybe foreign company, uh, should do to engage in the more connectivity related program in, in ASEAN regions is? I think so, it, it, this question maybe goes to the Mr. Lim and uh, in, in, the, in Singapore, uh, he, oh, sorry, in, in, in ASEAN here, please. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, thank you, Professor Lee. Um, for, for the private sector, uh, I think what we need is uh, PPP, three things. Um, PPP here means projects, platforms, and partnership. So um, ASEAN is trying to put forward some, some projects uh, and I think um, that is somewhere that we can co-create some projects, uh, not just with the private sector, but also with the, the governments. Um, so what, what is important is the, the platform and how the private sector can engage. 
the second P. Um, in terms of the platform, uh, ASEAN has a number of uh, platforms. Uh, for example, if you look at connectivity, we, we have uh, ASEAN Connectivity Coordinating Committee. So they have an engagement with uh, our partners. Uh, so it's government to government. Uh, but I think the private sector can actually uh, engage the, um, the uh, Korean mission to ASEAN or also engage ASEAN Korea Center uh, in engaging with the uh, relevant committees. Um, another aspect is uh, there is a regular meeting between the Secretariat and also the Association of uh, ASEAN Korean Chambers. So in, in that particular uh, meeting or dialogue, usually the Korean Chambers will raise some issues. Um, often the issues raised are somewhat national in, in nature, but I think we would appreciate if they could raise some regional issues and issues related to connectivity. I think we'll be happy to take it from there and then engage with the relevant sectors. Um, and then the, the, the third aspect is that, that there are different frameworks uh, that is uh, taking place. So one, one way is how we can actually uh, find ways to work together with different frameworks so that we can achieve better results. Uh, I hope that provides you with some um, uh, uh, flavor on, on how the private sector can engage ASEAN. Oh, thank you so very much. So please do touch base with us. Uh, happy to uh, discuss with, this with you further. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. How about Mr. Ruhimat? Do you have anything to say on the, the, to the private sector people? Well, I think this was uh, what I alluded to in terms of uh, you know investment in green bonds, uh, because again, when we look at uh, infrastructure development, that requires uh, a lot of financing, not only from the government but also from international international investors, and, and that is why it is very good to hear uh, from Mr. Um uh, that in fact Korea is promoting such instruments as uh, you know uh, green bonds because uh, this is where private sector can come in. This is where funds for from Korean investors who have already established, you know, high standards of uh, ESG can apply to uh, investments uh, in Southeast Asia. So, uh, of course, here at SCAP, we're trying to see how we can promote uh, sustainable finance and sustainable investment uh, in the region. And we also look to Korea as one of the developed countries in um, in promoting in establishing uh, such. Uh, high quality uh, investments for private sector involvement. Because again, uh, as earlier mentioned, uh, private sector involvement in infrastructure, in development, and also in creating sustainable development is very important. Thank you. Okay, I think this is almost time's up. But, uh, we have spent about one hour. We have four speakers and they make a good, excellent presentation. And also we have uh, some discussions. Some of the people make a questions and we gave an answer. I think all of members participated in this, in this program and also this panel session was, uh, I think, so quite so, uh, satisfied with these things and resulted. And I hope that everybody in this room have a wonderful time this time here. Okay, it's time's up. So that almost time to finish this section and thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. So that concludes our panel discussion session. Once again, we would like to thank our distinguished moderator, as well as all of our excellent panelists and participants for their fruitful debates and constructive discussions. So before we let them go, please give them another round of big applause. Thank you very much. So that marks the end of the first day of the ninth ASEAN Connectivity Forum. Before we let you go, ladies and gentlemen, please note that we have one more day to go, and tomorrow on day two, the introduction on the ASEAN ROK Cooperation Fund and the latest update on diverse projects in various sectors, including transport, energy, and smart cities, will be covered tomorrow, all of which will be streamed live once again. So please make sure you join us again tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. Korea Standard time. Well, that's all I have to say for today. Have a great evening if you're joining us here in Asia, or have a great day if you're joining us from Europe, Americas, Africa, the Middle East, and other parts of the world. Well, we'll see you again tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. KST right here on this channel. So please tune in again tomorrow afternoon. This is Pnami Kim. Thank you very much.